Outrocast. Long time fan of what it is that you do. Great to see a live record. Wasn't sure. Um, did you tape a bunch of nights or did you just tape one show and that's what we get? We taped, um, I think we did four nights, yeah, possibly in the UK, but I think most of them came from, I think most of it's Manchester. Wow. Okay. Did you have to mix and match or it is actually legitimately one show? It's no, it's not legitimately one show, but it's the majority I believe is from, is from Manchester, but I don't even, you know, to tell you the truth, I don't really know. There you go. Who was tasked with actually listening to everything and comparing the notes? Um, it was Blaine and Ben and our and their producer David Bennett. They they had the best the best handle on it. I did. I was responsible for picking out the best songs for what wound up on the the bonus disc that we put out years ago on High as Hell. Is that what it was? I think so. Yeah. But uh, me and my old our old engineer listened to like, I don't know, 53 versions of every fucking song. And like, you know, whatever, man. So I did it that time. <laughs> yeah, you did it that time. Somebody else could do it this time per se, but yeah. the band this found- was easy. This was only four shows they had to listen to. <laughs> but mostly we actually, we put the majority of it in the hands of our producer, David Bennett, because he knew he knew when we were on, he knew what was good. He'd, he'd recorded it all. He'd done front of house, he'd mixed it. And so he knew what was good. So he was like, this is my, you know, this is my recommendation. And Blaine was like, oh yeah, that's the stuff. And it's, it sounds, sounds spectacular, so. Did the set list vary at all because you knew that it was going to be a live release? Yeah, we made sure that we included all the songs that we swear in, so. Well, thanks to this release, we get Pillbilly, uh, Pillbilly Blues, which you co-wrote with Eddie Spaghetti. Uh, longtime contemporary. He's one of the bands I think of when I think of your band, per se. Uh, had you written a lot of songs with Eddie to get to this one, or is it a one-for-one? One? Like, this oh, is the helped, one thing, and you made the cut. Right. He helped us write that whole album. So he was our, uh, he was our fifth member at that point he came in we hired him to to what's the word corral corral a bunch of fucking cats <laughs> and we actually paid him money to like come in at this time and make us leave at that time because otherwise we'll just sit around and bullshit you know and jam we're just like who wants to play a nazareth song i want to play a nazareth song let's all play nazareth for a fucking hour and like oh man you know that reminds me of like you know, so of course Eddie's not going to put up with that shit. So he's like, "You guys, like, you know, I have a family, and then we're going to fucking work now." I was like, "Okay." So we hired him specifically for that, but it was for the songwriting process. And Peel Billy Blues is one of the ones that came out of that. And you know, obviously that is our uh, our I don't know what's the word for it. It's our our take on modern opioid crisis in our country and how it has affected the people in Kentucky specifically. It's funny to see how mature Eddie has gotten because he himself needed the babysitter X number of years ago. When do you feel that he became the grown up? <laughs> I don't know, maybe around the fourth child. <laughs> I don't know if he's ever become a grown up. He's still, but you know what's funny is that we played with him in California about a month and a half ago, and uh, it was a big outdoor venue, yeah. and his kids were there. and. One of the best parts of the whole, it was the first show back in the real world for like everybody, you know, and there's big lighting rigs on either side of this big ass stage. And his, one of his kids was climbing up it to watch the superset, watch dad at work. And in the middle of the show, his dad's out there rocking, the audience is going crazy. Everyone's flipping him off. And he looks over and he sees his daughter on the scaffold and he says, Elvis, get down from there. <laughs> It was just such a dad moment. It was just wonderful. It was like, so maybe now he's an adult. I don't know. He still Wait, acts like off stage. So was that that big outdoor show that also had the street walking cheetahs? Yeah. Yeah. Street walking okay. cheetahs, fishbone, suicidal tendencies. It was great. Horror pops. Like, oh my, did I say fishbone already? Yeah. Fishbone. They're so good. You said the name twice per se. Yeah. They were, oh my God. They were fucking awesome, man. Angelo Dove right in the crowd. It was like, you know, pandemic be damned. Everyone was just like, yeah, 
that, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was after two years of pent up rock and roll, just spewed out all over the place that day. It was glorious. And as far as I know, it was not a super spreader event. So Yay. Uh, in the case of Eddie, he didn't slow down one bit during the pandemic. He was writing and producing for other people and doing live streams. In your case, were you able to, you just mentioned, mentioned two years of pent up energy and aggression per se. Were you able to still be creative in some form? Let's see. Me? <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> Blaine wrote and, wrote and recorded an entire Nine Pound Hammer album. So he was really busy. He stayed really busy. Me, I focused my energies elsewhere for the most part. I was, uh, I, I went back to my dirty roots, which is playing in the garden. Which I was, I mean, I don't know if you know, I used to drive a tractor and I was- From Saskatchewan. Yeah, I was a tractor driver for seven years and I always had a big garden and pretty much everywhere I've ever lived, I've, I've tried to plant tomatoes and then, you know, rock and roll got the best of me and I'm generally not here during any season. So I can't do anything. I can't plant anything in the ground. So basically I just fell in love with my yard during this whole time off and it was really zen and really just wonderful to be, I don't know, plain in dirt. <laughs> I'm a dirty, I'm a dirt kid. I'm a hippie kid. So it felt really good. I was really excited. Yeah, that's always been an interesting about you specifically, that you play music that's so edgy, uh, frenetic, manic. And then anyone who meets you like, she's the nicest. She's funny. She smiles a lot. And that dirt hippie past per se versus the onstage persona is really night and day with you. Yeah, well, it's, I always thought of myself as kind of a yin yang lifestyle. Like, like I don't, I don't know. I lo- like even like even having two years off for me was really good because it it just makes all that rock and roll just want to burst out even more. And you know that's not a bad thing. Like I've always I always kind of thought that if I wasn't, I always this is going to be just sound stupid as hell, but but uh, I always thought I could be like a monk. <laughs> It's like, I'm really good at extremes and maybe it's from living in Saskatchewan, but like, you know, my martial amp, for example, it doesn't, there's, it's, there's numbers on it, but it doesn't really, once it's at two, that's, you know, that's as loud as it gets really. So it's basically an on off switch. And I'm kind of like that. I'm like, you know, time to hit the stage on. And then like you're off stage off. And I'm really good at both. (laughs) I'm, I'm fine with both. Like I really, I, you know, tragedy aside, I loved this time off. And I had, I just had a wonderful time. Like, and I did play, actually did play a bunch of keyboards. I got a new keyboard, which is really fun. And I did, I also got to record vocals for a Nazareth tribute that came out, which was, it was a for charity album. And I got to sing, I got to sing with Eddie Spaghetti. I got to sing Love Hurts, which is, if you've ever heard, if you <laughs> if you've never heard me sing with, with the voice of an angel, this is the, you got to check out our version of Love Hurts because you'll be like, that's not right. Or... <laughs> is, is that on that uh, record company, Kid and Robot Records? No, no, it's not Kid and Robot. It's on uh, the album, the record label is called Sostex. Actually, I have it. Where is it? It's right here. Sostex. It's called Heirs of the Dog. Ah, I see what they did there. Okay. And it's the entire Hair of the Dog album from beginning to end. And it's got... I, I see mean, Neil Fallon from Clutch is on there. Blaine here, is on there. Great. Yeah. Jason McMaster, Manny Charlton from Nazareth. Um, it's, and then Pincus is on here from Honky. And it's absolutely fantastic. It's really... And then I got to sing a song called Miss Misery, which mm-hmm. is one of the hardest songs i mean whatever just trying to sing that guy's voice is just so hard and this <laughs> is opposite of love hurts it sounds like i'm it sounds like i'm gargling razor blades like it's just it's i you can truly i think i really really got captured the spirit of misery <laughs> in my voice like it sounded like i almost blacked out i screamed so hard on it that well, was on a, on a totally different path here I want to come to you from a historian perspective on this because 
you know, you know a lot about the Motorhead side of things. You know a lot about the Graham Parsons world, clearly based on this tribute album and Love Hurts and all that. And I've heard Blaine talk about the band Black Oak, Arkansas. I was curious, related to all that, because I may or may not be writing a book about David Lee Roth. Nobody could give me a straight answer about this. Did Roth copy Jim yes. Dandy from yes. Black Oak, Arkansas? So you're saying yes. 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 <laughs> yes, of course he did. I think almost anybody who ever put on a pair of white pants should be paying some kind of royalty to Jim Dandy and his fabulous ass. Like, I mean, I know when I put on a pair of white pants, I thought of Jim Dandy. Uh, so did you ever meet Jim Dandy or ask him about that topic? Well, we didn't talk about David Lee Roth. No way. I was just busy basking in, you know, his enthusiasm. He's a very enthusiastic person, to say the least, especially when he's had a couple shots of whiskey. But yeah, we actually, um, we had a little side project for a while called Buzzard, which was badly named because there's about 400 other bands called Buzzard. But it was kind of a Southern rock. Thing where I played keyboards and mandolin. Blaine was just a side guitar player and some great shit, but we never released the album. But we did play two live shows, and one of them was opening up for Black Oak, Arkansas in Nashville at Hard Rock Cafe. And it was fucking awesome. And that was our first time ever meeting Jim Dandy in person. And they when they got up to play and they did Jim Dandy to the rescue, I knew all the fancy Nancy parts. I knew yeah. all the the background screaming, enthusiasm, hype girl stuff. And so I was doing it, you know, from the audience. And he was like, you know, this chick knows all the parts. And so he pulled me up onto this little podium and I got to do it with him on stage, which was like, you know, it was like the greatest moment of my life, like, holy fucking shit. And then later on, we recorded that very same song for another tribute put up by the same people that did this one. We did a Black Oak, Arkansas tribute called Mutants of the Monster. And in that one, I got to play the same part, but this time it was with Jello Biafra singing the Jim Dandy parts. And because Jello was a massive Jim Dandy fan as well. <laughs> Jello's wow. been wearing a star on his belt buckle since he was a teenager, and it was because Jim Dandy had a star belt buckle. Wow. Okay, so that's not the only singer that Jim Dandy inspired. The impression right. that I got, because you've been in Jim's vicinity, is that Mr. Roth, the smile is on stage and there's not a lot of smiling off stage, but Jim Dandy seems to be smiling 24 seven and very relaxed. <laughs> yeah, even with like half his teeth, he didn't give no, he's a he's a pretty genuine motherfucker, man. He's a he's on fire. He's like, but when you when you talk to, if you ever get a chance to talk to the guy, just prepare to sit back and listen. He's like, he's got a lot of stuff to say. <laughs> okay. And, and then the, the last classic rock question I have, before I say what's coming up in 20, uh, two, 2022 per se, uh, <laughs> I've had the pleasure of interviewing Ted Nugent a couple of times, but I've never asked him about your band. I always forget to do that. Do you know what he thinks of your band? And these days, I don't know. He probably, he probably still likes us. He's probably definitely still taking credit. I'm sure if he even remembers, but he, he interviewed me back in like, I don't know, for CMJ magazine when we were just kittens. And uh, <clears throat> he, it was basically like, it was very much like talking to Jim Dandy in that the interview where he was supposed to be interviewing me was basically him talking and me just saying, yes, uncle Ted. You are correct, Uncle Ted. I remember he chastised me for playing through a half stack at the time and not a full Marshall stack. But, you know, half stack is, I still only play through, I play through two half stacks now, not two double stacks. But at the time he was like, he was like, that's what I use to keep regular, you know, or something kind of gross like that. And, but it was like, oh yeah, thanks Ted. You know, like, God damn it. But he took credit for sure. He's like, he took credit for naming us, even though, I don't know if he remembers us. I mean, every now and then I pop on his Facebook page and agree with something. And, and he, he's, I get every now and then I was like, Ted Nugent likes your comment. Well, That's this okay. time I will hopefully remember because there's a new album coming from him very soon. But hey, uh, to repeat myself here, what's coming up in 2022? You know, whatever. We're doing all the shit we're supposed to do a fucking year and a half ago. You know, same thing as every other goddamn band. We're playing catch up. 
you know, this is a Mobius strip of music right now. Like, you know, so what, I don't know what year it is. <laughs> I don't care. It's, it doesn't matter. <laughs> And do you have a last thing? Do you have a TV recommendation to pass along if somebody says, hey, what is Ryder watching these days? And I need something new to watch. Oh, man. Well, everyone already watches Forensic Files, so I can't recommend that. Have you seen Utopia? I have not seen Utopia. Should I? Utopia, if you get a chance to see Utopia on BBC, it's the BBC version. I think Amazon redid it, but... Amazon also plays the BBC version, which is way more violent. And uh, it's kind of like Black Mirror meets a plague series. It's really brain fucking. If you're, inter if you're interested in having your brain fucked, I recommend Utopia. <laughs> okay, yep, yeah, that's my wife's wheelhouse. We'll be digging into that, but thanks for your time. Thanks for the many years of great music and hope to see you guys live in the very near future in New York. Yeah, and if you don't get it, if you can't come out, if we're not playing there, we have this great album called Eatin' Alive. <laughs> I see what you did there and Jim Dandy would be very proud. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Keep it up the greatness there. Take care. See you in New York. Bye. Outro cast. <laughs>